welcoming Mr. Steve D'Angelo to the stage. Well, thank you, Lauren, for that really spectacular introduction. And uh, let me thank Saul and Debbie and the ICANN team and recognize them for the amazing job that they've done organizing this conference. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to preface the rest of my remarks just by warning you that I am suffering from possibly the worst jet lag I've ever had in my life. So, I may lose track of myself from time to time. I'll try and reel back in as quickly as I can. If it gets really bad, somebody wave at me. Don't let me you know, stand up here and suffer, and you too. Um, I'd also like to honor the people and the government of Israel for decades providing a safe haven for cannabis research when few other countries were willing to step up, still are not willing uh, to step up. Right? And to the pioneering Israeli scientists like Dr. Meshulam, who have done so much to help activists like me have the kind of information and the kind of proof that we need to move reform forward. And I'd also like to honor all of us, right? Everybody who's working with cannabis, uh, with the science of cannabis, with the research of cannabis. Right? The uh, presentations that we're going to be hearing uh, today uh, are going to help empower more activists to dispel the myths and the stigma that are still clinging to cannabis. And doing that is going to help propel reform uh, forward to all the places of the world that it hasn't reached yet. And that reform, that reform in the States and in Canada has already saved millions of lives. And it has the potential to save hundreds of millions of other lives around the world. So the work uh, that we're doing, no matter how mundane or exciting it might be, no matter what our particular area of focus is, it's, it's heroic. It's heroic work. So give yourselves a hand. Um, so um, I'm really excited to, to, to see the presentations, hear the presentations that are going to be happening here. Uh, I've been studying cannabis my entire adult life. Uh, and it's such a rich and such a giving plant that still I continue to learn about it. I'm sure uh, that that's going to happen here uh, today. It certainly happened yesterday. But before we plunge into the how and the what of what we're about, I wanted to take a little while to think about the nature of cannabis and the work that we're doing with it in the broadest terms uh, possible. Uh, what we've accomplished thus far, what we might be able to accomplish uh, moving into the future, why it is that we do what we do. Another one of the things that, that I love about cannabis is its power to bring people from all sorts of different backgrounds together and, and join them in a common purpose. Uh, the way that we are here joined in this common purpose uh, today. And the corollary, natural corollary to bringing so many different kinds of people together is that there are many different perspectives on cannabis, uh, on the work that we're doing with cannabis uh, in any group of people that are focused on the subject, in this group, no doubt. So, all of those perspectives, each one of our perspectives, is true uh, and accurate and real and valuable coming out of our own experiences, our own pathway to this amazing plant. And I think that there's a lot of value in sharing those different perspectives uh, with each other. Uh, it helps us really build a balanced picture uh, of this plant and help guide our work moving forward. So. I'll share with you my 
perspective now, and, and, and this is a perspective that has developed over the course of 40 years, been influenced by the work that I've done with cannabis at various different times uh, in my life. And uh, the, the beginning, the, uh, the, the one of the most influential aspects of that experience was entering the cannabis movement 40 plus years ago, right? at a time when we were unaware of the science or the history of cannabis. All we knew then was what the prohibitionists had taught us, that weed gets you high. It took years of crawling through, searching the stacks in university libraries for me to begin to start learning the truth. And then, as Dr. Mishul and other scientists started expanding the frontier of cannabis knowledge, as we learned about the endocannabinoid system, as we learned uh, uh, about the confirmation of the incredible widespread efficacy of cannabis for so many different medical conditions, my perspective evolved. It evolved uh, in the course of the last dozen years as I've spent <clears throat> last dozen years, which I've spent serving uh, thousands and thousands of medical cannabis patients. It's been influenced by the viewpoint, the perspective that I've had on watching new legal cannabis states roll out their laws and what's happened in the wake of those laws. And I expect that my perspective, this viewpoint I'm going to share with you today is going to continue to evolve in the future. Maybe today as I, I talk to, to some of you, as I get new information, continue to learn. But now let me start back those low, those many years ago uh, at the beginning. So about 50 years ago, a beautiful and strange thing happened. It was centered in neighborhoods like Greenwich Village in Manhattan and Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, but it grew to be a global phenomenon. Millions of young people, educated young people from respectable families with good futures in front of them, dropped out of society. They left their homes, said goodbye to their parents, sometimes just ran away. And they gathered together, living communally in marginalized neighborhoods, in low rent housing, living on whatever they could scrounge uh, together. Voluntary poverty. They, and I'm going to say we, because I was born at the tail end of this generation, we were the first generation born after one of the most awful wars in human history. We were the first generation to live with the ever-present threat of nuclear annihilation. We grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust and the Cold War and learning for the first time that our food and our water and our air had been poisoned with industrial chemicals. So it was evident to us that the way of life that we had been brought up in was dysfunctional, that it was incapable of protecting or preserving life or justice for living creatures. We knew, we thought, we believed that the system had to be replaced or at least, at least radically modified. We knew that we needed to learn, right? but we didn't know what it was that we needed to learn. We were looking for a new way, but we didn't have any idea how to find that pathway. So we were open-minded. We experimented uh, a lot, searching for this, this new way of life, this better way of being. And over the course of some time, gathering together, sharing our food, sharing music, creating art with each other, having experiences, we found our way to a set of values. A set of values that included things like valuing freedom, individual freedom over authority, valuing tolerance over prejudice, 
valuing nature over industry and kindness over greed, peace over war, and above all else, we valued love over hate. And over time, many of us came to credit cannabis and the visionary substances that we were consuming with each other for helping us learn and live by those values. And we thought that maybe if we helped other people find their way to cannabis, that it would have the same effect on them. And that over time, as more and more people had these experiences and became affected by cannabis, that we would be able to build this better world, this thing that we were searching for, that we didn't even know what it was that we were searching for, right? So some of us, including me, made spreading this plant and teaching the knowledge that it teaches us our sacred mission. Back then, we didn't know about the history of cannabis. We didn't know about its medical effects. We didn't know that it was an industrial raw material that you could make 25,000 different things out of. We didn't envision cannabis being a feedstock for pharmaceutical products. We didn't imagine creating hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We didn't imagine the public markets in Canada blowing up. We didn't really know any of those things. All that we knew was that cannabis helped us be the people that we really wanted to be. And we thought that it could do the same thing uh, for other people. So today, of course, our understanding of cannabis is much more sophisticated. The endocannabinoid system has been discovered the widespread efficacy of cannabis for like this unbelievable range of medical conditions has been proven. Prohibitionist myths like the gateway theory have been thoroughly debunked. And now we don't have to speculate anymore about what happens when cannabis is legalized. We know that not only does the sky not fall, it actually gets a whole lot bluer. This has been the experience in multiple states, right? Yeah, that was pretty good, huh? All right, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was the experience, right? Multiple states over several years, the same thing every single time. Very clear and consistent results, right? <clears throat> Criminal organizations lose massive market share and corresponding power. A zillion jobs are created. Billions of tax revenue has been taken in. Cops who used to spend their time chasing a flower now get to chase criminals and universities all over the country are launching cannabis research centers and some of those universities are now offering curricula that's going to train the first generation of university educated cannabis professionals. Right? And those professionals are going to join an industry that already employs in the United States almost 150,000 people. Let me give you a little context. That's three times as many coal miners as there are in the United States. <clears throat> so uh, the economic and safety, public safety benefits of cannabis are no longer the conjecture and the promise of activists like me. They're objective facts that are verifiable by the government's own databases. So public health. <clears throat> Public health effects of cannabis are now also verifiable. We've seen what happens when you make cannabis more readily available to people. In every state that that's happened, there's been a 15% drop in alcohol consumption, mostly among young people. Okay? In many states, there's been a corresponding drop in traffic fatalities. 24.8% reduction in opioid overdoses in the first 20 states that legalized medical cannabis. 10% drop in violent crime in the city of Denver following legalization of cannabis. Study after study confirms it, right? When you make cannabis more accessible to people, overdoses drop, relapses go down, binge drinking is reduced, suicides down, domestic violence, domestic violence down in couples that use cannabis relative to couples who do not use cannabis. So what we've seen now is that this intuitive sense that us hippies had that cannabis can help us find a way to 
a more healthy, towards a more peaceful way of life, it's, it's being confirmed, right? It's true. When the laws are reformed and when more people consume cannabis, the world starts becoming a better place. Violent tendencies are tamed. Ingestion of harmful substances is alleviated. Addiction is quelled. Suicides are prevented. All of these things are not just good for the individuals affected, but good for society as a whole. Learning, learning, learning. So uh, we've been able to start measuring the, maybe measuring is the wrong word, assess the effects of cannabis legalization uh, on Harborside customers. And we took a look at all of our customers. We, we, we cross-checked a database with consumers, with the average California. What we found out was really interesting. The Harborside consumer, is more likely to be college educated or have a skill to trade, more likely to be married, and more likely to be a homeowner than the average Californian is. Right? So these things are obviously good for the people concerned, right? But also think about the, the flow on effects of increased education, increased home ownership, and more stable family lives. This is beneficial for all of us. This is beneficial for the whole society. So these effects, we're lucky now, you know, they're, 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 we're able to measure them. We have databases, the statistics are being collected, and I can come up here and I can make claims like this knowing that there's an objective basis behind them. There's a whole other range of benefits of cannabis that are more difficult to measure, that are often written off as just getting high, and I call them the overlooked wellness benefits of cannabis, right? I'm talking about the ability of cannabis to enhance the sound of music or the flavor of a meal or the touch of a lover's skin, right? Its ability to wake up a sense of play or spark creativity, to extend patience, to promote tolerance, to heighten appreciation of nature, to help aid in peaceful conflict resolution and deepen spiritual connection, right? I'm talking about the way that cannabis can help a lyricist find just the right word or a painter blend the perfect color, right? The way that cannabis can help an argument turn into a conversation or a walk in the forest turn into a spiritual experience or help a frustrated parent enjoy playtime as much as their kids are. The way that cannabis can help us engage with our own inner voices to identify our transgressions, however it is, we ourselves identify them and inspire us to heal them. The way that cannabis can bring a smile or even a laugh in situations where humor might otherwise seem completely impossible. So these are inherently difficult things to measure, but I think they may be the most valuable benefits that cannabis has to offer us, right? We, we're in a world that's teetering on the brink of self-destruction. Right? We are, have more and more nukes all the time that are pointed at each other. Hatred and racism is, is bubbling and boiling up. Uh, sects and ethnicities and tribes and religions are at each other's throat with genocidal violence that just seems to increase in viciousness and impunity as time goes on. Insufficient efforts still are being made to restore the natural balance of the planet that we all depend on. And our food and our air and our water is still being poisoned. And species that we've coexisted with for millennia are being wiped out at an ever-increasing and really terrifying pace. Young people, young people are so full of despair, so poisoned by ideology and digital madness, right, that they're competing with each other. They're competing with each other in ever more horrible and flamboyant ways to kill themselves and kill other people along with them. Right? So the stakes couldn't be higher if there's ever a time that we needed to learn how to be more tolerant of one another, this is the time. 
there's ever a time that we needed to learn how to appreciate and take care of our planet, now is the time. There is ever a time that we needed to learn how to resolve our inevitable disputes without violence, it's now. If there's ever a time to figure out how to put real brakes on mutually assured self-destruction before it actually happens, then the time is now. Right? If there is ever a time for us to transform our manifold hatreds into one love, and that time's now. So I know that I'm losing some of you now with the hippie dream thing, right? <laughs> and it's true. It is a hippie dream, right? It is a hippie dream. But 40 years ago, they told me that legalizing cannabis was just a hippie dream, and it's true today. And in the years in between, in the years in between, us hippies have introduced some pretty groovy things to mainstream society, like yoga and organic food, you know, acupuncture, personal computers, a few of these things that we think are valuable today. So I believe, and I believe in the power of hippie dreams, right? Look, we know that cannabis helps couples resolve their marital disputes more peacefully, right? Well, why wouldn't it make sense that it will help larger groups of people do the same thing, or that it might help us address other manifestations of sexism, right? We know that cannabis helps veterans ease the transition from combat and learn how to more live more peaceful lives. Is it really crazy to think that it might do the same thing for larger groups of soldiers? Right? We know that cannabis reduces violent crime. So warfare, is it, is it crazy? Is it crazy to think that maybe if it reduces violent crime, it might also reduce mass violence against each other? We know that cannabis was used by the activists who desegregated the American South, and that millions of cannabis consumers have turned anti-racist songs by artists like Bob Marley and Snoop Dogg into international smash hits, right? Is it really crazy to think that cannabis, that more widespread cannabis use might also have positive effects, other positive effects on racism. Right? So the stakes are, are high, they're really high. If we don't wake up now, soon, we might not have many more generations to do it in. And cannabis isn't the answer, but I think it's part of the answer, right? Given the manifest individual, public safety, public health benefits that I've just talked about, I don't think that we can afford not to explore the social healing potential of cannabis. So, do I really have three minutes left? Oh, wow, that went really fast. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a, a chunk out here, right? And, <laughs> and I'm going to cut to the chase, um, and um, I'm going to uh, talk about medical cannabis very briefly and, and say that it, it, it should be really the tip of the spear in our efforts and not the end of the road. Right? If cannabis ends up being limited uh, only to the medical therapeutic arena, if it can only be obtained with prescriptions, then a small proportion of the number who really member of people who can benefit from it, which I think is everybody who has an endocannabinoid system, right, is going to get it, and they're going to pay pharma prices. Right? We would never see the widespread transformation that that wider use of cannabis might unleash. Right? We'll never find out about violent crimes and war and sexism. So I think. Medical cannabis has to be a stepping stone to where we're going, but not the end of the road. So how do we get there, right? Medical cannabis is, is, is moving, it's gaining a lot of momentum, it's gaining in professionalism, but how do we get from medical cannabis that next step down the road, which, which I call cannabis uh, for all, right? So my hope is that the same methods the same rigor that we use to prove and quantify the therapeutic effects of cannabis can be applied to the social benefits of cannabis, the social healing benefits of cannabis, right? 
that we can prove and quantify them. Just like all of the modern science that we have now is proving and, and quantifying the reports of cannabis and all the ancient medical texts. Just like the public safety and public health statistics that we're collecting have validated the intuitive sense of the hippies. I think that we can do that with the social healing aspects of cannabis as well, right? So my plea to, to those of you who are scientists, who are working with science, who are researchers, who are here in this room, who are funding research and funding science, right? Is to stretch, stretch your imaginations. And don't stop at the therapeutic potential of cannabis, right? Work to prove and demonstrate its full potential, its ability to really change the world that we're living in, right? to change consciousness. That kind of science would be tremendously helpful to activists like me as we move reform forward, as we try to move reform forward, right? All of us here today, right, we're at the beginning of something that's going to grow much, much, much bigger. Right? We're going to play a critical role in the trajectory of cannabis moving forward. And that gives us tremendous influence and it gives us a tremendous responsibility. So let's do something really magnificent with that power that we have with that ability to influence and grow and guide the way that cannabis is going to move into the future, right? Let's make sure that it can achieve its fullest potential. And let's start first by making sure that every sick person in the world who needs cannabis gets it. But let's not stop there. Let's, let's build support forward by demonstrating the social healing potential of cannabis. And then let's take that demonstration, that evidence, let's continue boiling that support and moving it forward, right? Ever forward and not stopping until we get to the point where cannabis is really fully free, where it's in the hands of every adult anywhere around the world who really wants it, right? Until the last cannabis prisoner comes home and nobody ever gets arrested.